one million dollars, or one person saved. When someone puts down Christianity, do you speak up or do you stay silent? What if your friend is down on life? Do you mention God or just tell them they'll be okay? Is it that hard to talk about God? We say we are Christian but never put it into action. We all talk about how things should be done but never act upon it. We are scared to be evangelists for the Lord. Today is the day to change. Put your pride aside, put your ego away, and spread the word of God for those who desperately need it. This world needs change, and one small step will make a difference. It's very easy to talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? church. Yay! Yay. That's right. The affirmation requires happiness. All right, well, yesterday we had the fish fry that raises money for our fire department and 340, Tom? Yes. About 340 people came through. Wow. About half of them were take out, so that was an all-time record. So that's exciting. We got to introduce uh, pilots from one of our helicopters. Yay! And so that was a good time. All right, right here. Not this Sunday night, but next Sunday night, that guy in the back, everybody turn around and look at Rick. He's going to preach his very first message. Give me a hand. All right. Five o'clock. Five o'clock. So you need, if you're willing to show up and say amen, don't yell hell, heretic or liar. Don't say that. Just say amen. And uh, he's going to do his very first sermon. So we're looking forward to that. All right. Next week. We're not going to meet tonight, but we'll do that next week. All right, let's pray and get started. Father God, we thank you for the day. We thank you for all that you're doing, all that you will do. Be glorified this hour by us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A couple of things. Uh, last Saturday of the month, we're having our Fall Fest Reformation Day. So y'all report in to, to Joanne and let her know what you want to do. Or Tom, Tom, I think you kind of did our layout for our, for our roundup. It'll be pretty much the same layout. So we'll look forward to that, 10 to 2 that Saturday. So we're going to do Fall Fest, but we're also going to kind of have a little Reformation information on that, so we look forward to that. So that'll be a lot of fun. All right. Oh, if you're a visitor, do we have any visitors today? I think we've got a couple of visitors. Who can get, hand out some gift bags for us? Richard. Richard. All right, Gianna and Richard, why don't you all hand out gift bags? <laughs> look, looks like... One um, visitor. Uh, next Sunday's also regular conference schedule conference night. Okay. Um... We may have to reschedule that. We'll work on that. Um, 
Yeah, we'll figure that out. We'll figure that out. We may can do that afterwards or something like that. We'll get it figured out. All right, if you're a guest, raise your hand. It's like, uh, Elizabeth, you have a guest today? You have a guest? She looks like a guest. Have you been here before? Okay, she's been here before. You give her a bag anyway. I bet she didn't get it back. Give it back. Raise your hand so you can get it back. All right. All right. She's bashful. She's the one blushing between these two right here. You can give her a bag. All right. All right. Okay, very good. All right, let's all stand. We're singing Graves to Gardens. And uh, everything is out of order, just FYI. Oh, um, and also we're not singing He Lives. <laughs> it was last minute change. We're going to sing I Stand Amazed, which, by the way, um, Neil, what page is that in the hymnal? Do you know? How marvelous uh, is this? There, okay, so he's going to have that up. Right now, we're singing Graves to Gardens. I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me There's empty graves Treasures that fade
Where all the love I've ever found 
Good morning. Today's scripture is from 1 John. And this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for those of the whole world. Not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. I love that. <clears throat> okay, can you turn my keyboard on, Root? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we're playing, we're doing Be Thou My Vision. And um, last time we did it, I put an Irish spin on it because I was in an Irish mood. And it turns out it's actually an Irish hymn. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, are you ready? Okay, do your first note for me. Okay, here we go. Oh, ruler of 
every week, at least two times, maybe three times a week, I feel the need to tap in and find out what's going on in the world. In the world. And I remember this week, I said, Joanne, let's, let's just uh, turn on the TV and just for a few minutes. We usually turn something on when we're eating together. And uh, just, just get some idea of what's going on in the world. And almost without exception, I regret it. This week was no exception. We turned on to hear somebody talk about birthing persons and how inappropriate it is to be exclusive and talk about pregnant women only because there are other people that can be pregnant and birthing persons. And you wonder how the world gets inside out and backwards. But there's a progress and there's a process by which it happens. And it began in the garden. It began in the garden with a question. When the serpent questioned God, when the serpent questioned God in subtlety, in Genesis chapter 3, he comes to Eve and we experience something, we'll talk about what we experience. Now the serpent was more crafty, crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, notice that first word, and the King James, has God surely said the first question is questioning is that did God really say this did God really say this questioning what God has said indeed has God said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden any tree of the garden the woman said to the serpent from the tree from the trees of the garden we may eat but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden God has said you shall not eat of it nor touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Watch the progression. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from his fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And it says their eyes, verse 7, were opened and they saw things that God never intended for them to have to see. Subtlety. There's something called change blindness. It's uh, something that can be an intentional deception. And we see a little bit of this with what Satan did. There's a training video to demonstrate that they used in college. It's called the door study. And in the door study, there was a man asking a man for directions. And he puts a map in front of him and he's asking him how to get where it is that he wants to go. And what happens is a door comes by and it puts a barrier between the man and the person he's talking to. And what they do is have a whole different man come in and continue the conversation. And the guy that's giving him directions doesn't even know he's talking to somebody different. There's another training video that was included in that same, uh, that same curriculum in the students were told to try to count how many times the ball gets passed. There's people in white t-shirts and people in t-shirts with an S marked on it, and you're supposed to count how many times the ball gets passed to someone with an S on their t-shirt. And everyone's counting, and at the end of it, you know, people ask, okay, who, who got the count? And they'll tell them if they got the count right or not. What they don't notice is while they're counting the times that the basketball gets passed, a guy in a full-on gorilla suit comes in the middle of the video, Stops, does this, and walks all the way through. And the people that are so focused on counting basketball passes, when you ask the class at the end of the exercise, and I've been there when this has been done, how many of you noticed the gorilla? They'll be like, what gorilla? <laughs> easily, easily, less than a third of the class will notice the gorilla because they're so focused on, that, on, on something that's taking their eyes away from from really what is the biggest thing that just happened. Change blindness. It's a subtlety. It's a subtlety. And Satan comes in subtleties. He comes in, and the first thing he says is, did God indeed say? He questions God's word. The next thing that he does is he questions God's certainty. And the next thing he does is he questions, he's really questioning God. And then he goes from questioning God to directly challenging God. You shall not surely die. 
And after directly challenging God, he attributes to God motives that are not his. Do not ever attribute to someone motives if you don't know their motives. Ask, but that's a satanic thing. Satan attributed to God impure motives. He's just saying that to you because he doesn't want you to be powerful like he is. He's keeping you from something. That was a lie. It was a lie. But it was enough to begin to turn her heart. It was enough to put questions in her heart. It was enough to help her to inch closer to the very thing that was about to kill her. It made her comfortable getting closer to the very thing that would kill her, her children, her children's children, for generations and generations and thousands and thousands of years. You see, little things do matter. Little things do matter. And so here we are. And so we ask ourselves, how did we get here? How do we get to the place where up is down, down is up? We talk about pregnant men. It was a ridiculous movie when Schwarzenegger made it. It never should have been made. It was the worst of his movies, twins, you know. Ridiculous. It wasn't even, it was just ridiculous. How do we get here? How do we get here? We got here a step at a time. And the truth is we need to be cleaned up. We need to be cleaned up. We what we need to understand about Jesus is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What that means is none of us, regardless of where we are in our level of sanctification, are we at the level of purity where we don't need to change something. Amen. What do we need to change? Hebrews 12 says, run the race set before you. Set aside the weights and the sin that easily besets you. <clears throat> Key verse here is going to be 1 John 1, 10 actually, or actually, yeah, 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. We will ever and always contend with our sin. We always have sinned until we see him face to face, until we meet him and are glorified. The problem is that we don't see our own sin because of change blindness, nose blindness. I had a truck. And um, a guy that used to be a canine officer rode with me to a training exercise, or we went out to lunch together at a training exercise. And I'd gotten used to my truck, but it was a used truck. And somebody that owned that truck had owned a dog. And something really bad had happened in that truck. I don't know why. But when my friend got in the truck, he said, you've had an animal in this truck. I said, well, not me. I'd gotten used to it. But to him, it was abhorrent. To him, it was offensive. To him, it didn't smell like what did he wanted to smell on the way to lunch. <coughs> the reason we don't change sin is because we don't see sin. And the reason we don't see sin is because we've just gotten used to it. Now, there's an extreme. On one end, we get used to it because we're used to our own smell. The smell of our own house, smell of our own car, smell of our own socks, whatever. <laughs> on the other end is a self-righteous status that says, you know, I'm so far down the road, I think I've got this whipped. We don't have it whipped. We don't have it whipped. The sin that easily besets you, everyone in this room has a besetting sin. And if you think you don't have it, it might be pride. And so, I mean, really, it, look, the closer you walk with God, <coughs> we get novocaine. We grow numb to sin. S sin causes pain, okay? Sin causes pain, but we don't feel it because we get numb to it. Why? Because we get used to it, Right? We sit too long. We don't even feel our feet. And so we have to be honest with ourselves. Whether we've just gotten used to it on this end and we need to clean up, or whether we spend so much time with God over here that we think the two or three little sins that we've got left, he understands it's not that big a deal. But it is. But it is. The little things matter. And one sin, little sin, any sin, is enough to separate us from the heart of God. It's a stench in his nostrils. We need to clean up. We need to clean up. Treasure hunt. The treasure of cleanliness. First of all, we need to understand the author of this message. The author of this message is not John the Apostle. The author of this message, in fact, is Jesus. This is the message that we have heard from him, capital H, and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We wish that we could be completely pure like God. I don't know, but if you were, you probably would be hated, right? You think Jesus was popular in his own family? 
Do you think his brothers loved him? Do you think his sisters loved him? The guy always had the right answer. He was always right. He was never wrong. Right? Now we, now we all know people that are often wrong but never in doubt. Right? That's a different story. But Jesus was actually never wrong. And people like that often aren't popular, right? But, but God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And so what that means for us that live in the shadows so often, that see the shadows so often, and C.S. Lewis talked about this world, and he called it shadow lands. Shadow lands. This is only, this, we think that we see things as they are. When we get to heaven, we're going to see things as they are. We're going to see things clearly. You ever have glasses on and they get fogged up? You don't know they're fogged up? Or they're scratched up. You don't know they're scratched up. You take them off and you're like, Shazam. Or maybe you walk around without your glasses. You put glasses on and you're like, Shazam, that's me, right? Some of us have things the other way around. Rusty's always funny. Can you hear me, Rusty? Because Rusty goes shooting with us and everyone else puts hearing, hearing protection on. And Rusty takes his out because he can't hear anything without the hearing. <laughs> so he does it the other way. Some of us have ways. But we're living in Shadowlands. At our best. At our best in this life, we need to be cleaned up. The prophet says all of our goodness is as filthy rags. We try. We really, really do try. Now, being married to a germaphobe, it is impossible for me to be perfect. And she, I, I am told, I am ordered to wash my hands about 35 times a day. I'll probably do it more. But it's so funny to me to watch her because... She'll have things laid out just perfect. And one of our dogs will give them over and touch it with a paw. She'll be like, ah, she'll throw it out. And, have to do everything. and that's a joke with humans. But with God, you know, God is pure. He's really, really, really pure. And the impurities matter. If you don't think so, look at this COVID thing. If you, think, if you don't think so, look at contamination. Watch some of these programs that, watch, that document cross-contamination where they'll put dye on people's hands and maybe somebody in a restaurant or whatever and you don't realize. And then later on, they'll put the ultraviolet light on it. And what? You see... You see contact everywhere, cross contact everywhere. We're just not, we're not attentive. We're not aware. Sometimes we just don't care. But I don't care as much as she does. But, but God does care. And, and that's why we need his help. We need his help to get clean. Wouldn't it be great to be clean? Wouldn't it be great to be clean? What are the benefits of being clean? Being relatively clean, right? Keeping the account up to date. Being attentive to the things that God hates and the things that he wants to change. What are the benefits of that? Talked about in Sunday school, right? The full armor of God. The belt of truth. I didn't want to interrupt you because you were teaching and you were moving and grooving. I didn't want to say anything. But when I think about that belt of truth, I think about when we turn the news on. And, and, and when I wore a belt, I had my bat belt. And I had all my stuff on my belt. But it also held everything together, right? It held everything together. And I turn on the TV and I listen to the news talking about pregnant men. I'm like, dear God, save us. The world is coming unraveled. We've got stuff, but it's not together anymore. The truth holds it all together. When I had the belt on and I've got my gear on my belt, I can get whatever I need off my belt. I can do, you know, the eight, ten things they get in the problem with my career is they give me something new to put on my belt every six months and I got to where I was running out of belt, right? But if I got the belt and everything's tied up and everything's tight, then I can go and I can use that and it's keeping everything together. And the problem we have in this world is we've lost truth because they've denounced God and denounced Scripture and divorced themselves from scripture as a culture and so now we got all this stuff but it's all hanging everywhere and we're not held together anymore the world's coming apart it's coming unraveled and that's not good it's cool when i've got a belt and i can reach and get my tools it's not cool when i'm holding them like you know i'm at the grocery store how's that going to work right it doesn't work god is light and in him there's no darkness at all if we say we have fellowship with them and yet walk in darkness we lie and we do not do the truth watch this do the truth in Sunday school this morning the question was posed what is righteousness righteousness is doing the truth righteousness is doing the truth what's the truth the word our sword is the word our sword is the word we do the truth. That's what we need to do. And you all know somebody that talks one thing and they do something else. We can't do that. Our, our doing and our saying needs to be the same. We need to have integrity in that. If we say we have fellowship in him and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. Why do people walk in the darkness? Jesus said it. 
They, they walk in the darkness because they don't want people seeing what they're doing. They want to do it in the dark. I remember one time that a, a, a TV personality got caught dirty in a relationship he wasn't supposed to be in. And one of my former trainers used to be a Border Patrol agent. And he used to fly over that guy's mansion. He said, I could have told you 10 years ago. We used to see the parties that they had on the roof. I knew exactly what that guy was about. People do things in the dark and they think people don't see, but what you do in the dark comes out in the light. What is done in the dark comes out in the light. You can't keep stuff in the dark. Don't do things in the dark. Don't hide. Don't lie. Don't be shady. Be about the light. Amen. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. And you can go backwards with that. You can reverse engineer that. You're not going to have light if, you're not, if your sins aren't covered by Jesus. Once your sins are covered by Jesus, you have light, you're in the light, you're walking in the light, and then guess what else? If you're walking with him properly, you're going to walk with your brother properly. Amen. If you're walking with him in the light, there's no reason for conflict. Because when we come to a crossroads, we tell him, okay, we got to do this, do that, you know what? We reschedule, we make a change, we, we, we work with each other, we defer to each other, we make things work because we love each other and we care about each other, and it's not a conflict because we're not competing. We are not competing. We are following a curios who has an exact will for our life. In Sunday school last week, they talked about the relationship of marriage. Steve Stroop said, before I got married, I didn't have any conflict. I did whatever I wanted to do. And then somebody was putting the toilet paper on the one way. Then someone was squeezing the toothpaste the wrong way. Anyway, he didn't say which it was that was doing it. The truth is, is when we are in close quarters with other people, that requires grace, forgiveness, love, deference, care, um, concern, loving one another according to knowledge. See, that's all work. That's all work. But you're motivated to do that when everything that you do is rooted in the heart of God that loves you and made you for what? For fellowship. He didn't make us to come to fight. He didn't make us to squabble. He didn't make us to contend with one another. He made us to love each other, to build each other up, to help each other. Twice. Well, our church is not, we're not a commune, but we take care of each other. And we meet each other's needs. And we've had the privilege of supplying some things as people have made them available to be a part of that supply. That's a privilege. We always do that while helping people to help themselves, always. But there's joy in being the body of Christ who has a very alive mind and knows everything that we need and supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And some of you, your greatest need today is to be clean. Some of us need to come to God. I include myself. We need to come to God and say, Lord God, I've got this thing that keeps tripping me up. I've got some things that are slowing me down. And I need to master it, and I need to put it where it needs to be, and I need to put, put it to bed, nail it down, be done with it, and roll forward. That requires what? That requires two things, surrender and faith. It's almost like salvation. What, what brings you to the point of salvation? Repent and believe. Change your mind that leads to a change of direction in an absolute faith, putting all of your however many pounds onto that chair that you sit on. Every one of you are sitting in a bench. There's a lot of benches that you're not sitting on. You're not pastuoing any bench except the bench that you're sitting on. But the bench that you're sitting on, you're putting everything that you have on that that you will not land on the floor. It takes faith to make a difference. It takes faith to say, Lord, I want you to clean me up. I want you to take those. If you're so great that you've only got last three things, then okay, you get those and then God will show you another three. Amen. Okay, because we're not ever going to be there until we see him face to face. That's why it says, if we say we don't have sin, we make God a liar. He said... All have sinned and fallen short of the righteousness of God and will always be short until we see him face to face. That glorification is coming, but we're not there yet. So if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Not contention, not strife, not trouble. Fellowship. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We need to be cleaned up. We need to be cleaned up. 
cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Here's where we get in trouble. We get in trouble when we take the word of God and then we step over one step. Once you move from the word of God to imaginations based on the word of God, you're in trouble. I had a lady once teach in a venue and began to teach based on a dream she had, a vision she had. We had to talk and said, we don't, we don't do that. You, your vision or your dream can be an illustration. We teach the Bible, the Bible alone. Amen. Whatever encounter you have in your personal encounter with God, I may be able to encourage you with my personal encounter with God. That may inspire you. I may be able to share with you something that you may be able to take on in some practice way as far as here's when I have my quiet time. Here's how I pray. I told you when I was a kid, I used to climb trees. Now I'm too old to climb, so I have to do it somewhere else. But I can give you tips and I can give you ideas about how to spend time with God. And that can be advice, but I'm not going to teach you that. If you ask me that, I'm going to teach you this book. Because when I go one degree off of that, then we're in trouble. I'm going to teach you what it says. I'm not going to teach you what it doesn't say. If it's a place for opinion, I'll tell you what I think based on an educated, I'll tell you what three guys think that I think are all smart guys and all love the Lord and probably what the continuum is. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Some people think it was Barnabas. Some people think it was Paul. Some people think it was Apollos. Okay? But Hebrews has some of the most sophisticated Greek in the entire Bible apart from the book of James. So that narrows it down a little bit. Apollos was an extremely accomplished teacher. I can give you reasons why I think maybe it was Apollos. I can give you some reasons why I think it might have been Paul. Similar illustrations, athletic imagery, almost parallel to the chapter with the book of Romans on some things. Very interesting. But then again, you look at those books and they're the same length. Why? Because scrolls were the same length. And they wrote until they were done with the scroll. That's why Hebrews and and some of these, you know, they all have about 13, you know, 13 to 16 chapters. They quit. It was over when they quit writing. They wrote on one side. They turned around and wrote on the other side. And when they were done, they were done. Because you only have so much to write on. Wouldn't like go to Office Max and get some more paper. You were limited, okay? And so these things, there's these things. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in. So whatever our reason is, regardless of where we are in the continuum, and this is what I hear most of the time. What I hear most of the time from people is, I know the Lord doesn't want me to do that, but. And that's what I hear all the time. Or the Lord understands. The Lord knows me. The Lord knows, or, you know, my mom and dad, or, you know, I'm Irish, or I'm, you know, whatever I am, American Indian, whatever. We think that if we're mostly all right, then we're all right. I'm here to tell you that that one thing can get you. It can hurt you. I'll just give you a, an extreme example. <clears throat> My aunt that died in the 1990s, she was alive during the Depression. She was born in the teens. And she smoked from the time she was 14 years old until she was 84 years old. Now, from a child... I guess I saw a bunch of those Shick Shadle commercials. I was always an evangelist trying to get people to quit smoking. I didn't just start it now. But it's always been a concern. Matter of fact, my, my uncle's second wife had long, dark hair, and I fell in love with her. She was a singer. wonder why I picked Joanne. Anyway, long, dark hair. I think my, my uncle met her in a club where she was singing, and she was smoking. I went and pulled her to the back end of the house and said, Listen, I love you. I want you to quit. And she cried and gave me a big hug. Anyway. My aunt, 14 years old to 84 years old, smoked like a chimney. And I all the time tried to talk to her. Of course, she got nowhere. And she kept telling me how it's genetic and some people get cancer, some people don't get cancer. My little aunt, I was the only one with her when she was dying. Out of all my family, I was the only one there. And she went all those years, and yes, she didn't get cancer. But when she was on her deathbed, she was wheezing and drowning and suffering, and it was horrible. And I wish to God that she would have just stopped that one thing. I wish to God that she could have laid there in bed 
and died gently in her sleep and not had that horrible experience that went on for hours and hours and hours while she struggled and was like a drowning person. I wish. We think if we're mostly okay, we're okay. But the truth is, is that God loves us so much. He loves us too much to say, you know that one little thing? That's all right. It's not a big deal. Just go ahead. Go ahead. Because God knows what the result will be of it. Anybody that's ever shot knows. From here to the door, I can be off. I can be off. We had a whole deal where we'd take our sights and you'd put the, you're supposed to line up. When Joanne got her concealed carry, she shot better than anybody else in the class except for a hunter. One day we went shooting and she was all over the place like a shotgun blast. I'm like, what are you doing? I said, you're using your sights, right? She goes, what's that? I said, you put the dot in between the posts? She goes, you never told me that. <laughs> Some people are just naturally gifted. But, but we did a deal where you put the post in the middle and you shoot. You put the post all the way to the right, you know, in the wrong place and you shoot. You put the post all the way to the left in the wrong place and you shoot. And from here to the door, it's only about this much spread. It's not that big a deal. But you take a rifle and you move one degree and you're shooting at 100 yards and you're shooting the wrong person, right? And that's what we take for granted. We take for granted the compounding consequences of being just a little off. And depending on what you're doing, that actually can be lethal to yourself or to somebody else. Little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate, the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He himself is the propitiation of our sins, not for our sins all, only, but for the sins of the whole world. There's a lot there. Children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. God's desire for us is that we not, you know, did I, I skip the whole spot. What am I doing? I'm sorry. Let's go back. Good Lord. The best part. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do we get clean? First of all, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're already clean as far as are you going to heaven or not. But you can walk around dirty on this planet. And that's why James says true religion is to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself what? Unspotted from the world. Now, Joanne and I have an ongoing little battle. She says to me, Chris, you brought mud in the house. And I say, Joanne, there's mud outside. <laughs> I, I got sand where I parked my truck. And it is almost impossible for me not to bring some of that into the house. And as much as I stamp my feet, as much as I rub my feet, as much as I do everything I can do when I walk in the house, it's really difficult for me not to transfer that minuscule sand into my house. And my sweetheart likes a white floor. So it's very visible. God, it's hard for us, guys. We live in this earth. We live in this earth. We live amongst dirty people. We live on a dirty planet. We, uh, uh, yesterday at the firehouse, this one guy, I won't say which, just loves to tell dirty jokes every time he's around me because I guess I'm the pastor. He just thinks it's funny to tell dirty jokes. Every time he gets around me, he likes to tell another dirty joke just to see what my face will do. I just look at him like, next, you know, whatever. So like I haven't heard it before in thirty, you know, three decades of cop work. Anyway, I'm pretty sure you're not going to say anything I haven't heard before. So it's hard for us. We need to wash our clothes. We need to wash our hands. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Remember what he said? Remember what Peter said? Wash my head. Wash. I just need to wash your feet. That's what's been in contact with the world. That's what needs to be cleaned up. We have to be honest. We we're, you're not Superman. You may get up spiritual. You may do your morning devotional. You can go out and mix it up in this world. Five minutes later, you're going to get unspiritual. You don't think so? Let somebody cut in front of you. You don't, say, you don't think so? Let somebody take something that's yours. You may, be, you may have righteous indignation, but some of that that follows may not be righteous. You don't think so? Let somebody insult you. Let somebody give you that look. Let someone speak to you condescendingly. How do you handle that? When someone talks to you condescendingly. Go talk to, go try to do business with someone that's rude to you when you're paying for their business and they're rude to you and they're disrespectful to you. It doesn't take long to, to take on some of the things that we see in the world, does it? It doesn't take long. So what do we do? How do we clean up? Confess. This word confess is very important. This is not Bill Clinton confession. Okay, you caught me. Okay. Deny, deny, deny till I die. Oh, 
Oh, okay, well, you did catch me. All right. What is the definition? Of what, it depends on what the definition of is is. Okay, well, that's, that's some desperation right there. Now, confession is not you caught me. Confession is agreeing with God about your sin. So when we come to God, we don't just go, okay, God, I've got to come to you because the police have caught up with me and now I've got to go to court or the IRS has caught up with me and now I've got to make payments or, you know, whatever else, you know, my wife or husband's caught up with me and so now I've got to change my game, whatever. It, my kids have caught up with me. They realize I am not who I should be. That's not confession. Biblical confession is agreeing with God about your sin where you come to the place where that pride in you that arrogance in you, that hostility in you, that impatience in you, that sneakiness in you, that guile in you, whatever it is that's in you that needs to get purged from you for you to be a pleasant aroma to God, you find the same thing in that that God sees in it, the disgustingness, the decay, the thing that's heart, that's bad for everyone around you when you do that. And by the way, whatever it is that you're struggling with that you're holding on to, let me tell you what you don't think about sometimes. You're impacting other people. You think that you can hold on to that thing. And, and most people think I've got the right to do that. No, you don't. And not only does it impact you, but it impacts others. And let me tell you something. For my aunt, who I love, that smoked for 60, 70, whatever years, anybody that looked at her and said, well, it's okay for her, so it must be okay for me. And how many of those people walked away with cancer? That's what we got to understand, is that what we do, we're all being watched by somebody. And if we accept something that God said is never acceptable, then the impact of that on others is that others will, will say to themselves, somehow maybe that's okay for me. And now we've contributed to another person's pain and maybe even another person's death. Because not everybody can do what you can do. You may be good at juggling. They may not be so good. They may land on their head. If we confess our sins, we need to agree with God about the thing that needs to change. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. That's amazing. That's amazing. I apologized to a lady one time for doing something. And she said something to me that was really, she was trying to be gracious, but it was really bad what she said. She said, you know, everyone has a reason for what they do. What she should have said to me was, you're right, that was wrong. Don't you ever do that again, but thank you for apologizing. Because when she said to me, you know, everybody has a reason for what they do. What that means is, is as long as you've got a reason, it's okay. Yeah. No, it's not, right? It may be devastating. And in fact, the thing that I apologized for was devastating to another person. I caused them pain. I regretted it. I had a reason to regret I should have regretted it. I was convicted. I was under conviction. When I apologized, I was humbling myself to say this is something I did wrong that I never should have done. I never want to do it again. And she should have agreed with me because God laid it on my heart to apologize. She should have agreed with me. She should have said, you know, you're right. That was wrong. And that's where we have to realign our heads and our hearts with God and look at everything from the God's eye view and not from the ground up. You understand? Yeah. Not based on your emotions, not based on your ideas, not based on your traditions, not based on any of that, based on God's eye view. It's like going and getting tires when your car's out of alignment. You got pretty tires for a while. They're fixing to the be like that. You know, the, the tread's fixing to move right over because if your car's not aligned, it doesn't matter if you have new tires aligned. They're not going to last. We have to align. Our, you can spend a lot of money on tires. I just spent $1,000 this week on tires. God provided that. I'm thankful for it. But $1,000 on tires, right over there. Yokohama, hurry. All right? Sardis. Saved $200 less than a place over there. So there you go. There's your commercial. But listen, if, if, you're, if your stuff's not straight, you're just going to tear your tires up. That's what you're going to do. We used to have a car that would never, they declared it unalignable. And it was a rear tire. And I would place the tire on that corner every, it was ridiculous. It was a, 2006 Impala. There's, a, there's an uncommercial. Anyway, we need, to be, we need to be lined up. So then, my little children, I'll write these things to you. We have the advocate, Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross and he cried out to Telestai, he says it is finished, but to Telestai is also a marketing term. It is a commercial term. It means paid for, paid in full. 
And when it's been paid for, somebody else can't come pay for it. It's been paid for. Paid for, paid for, paid for. It's done. And so the devil ever and always accuses us. He's Diablos. He's the accuser of the brethren. If you find yourself sitting in the seat of the scoffer looking at your brother in Christ, you better be careful because that's a satanic seat. Get out of it. Do not sit in the seat of the scoffer. It's not your chair. It's not your place. If you wonder about somebody, go talk to them in love and don't tell them what they're doing. Ask them. And then share with them what your concerns are and then roll with it from there. Based on the scriptures, you're agreed upon God and then roll together in that based on what matters and not based on what does not matter. But the, the devil likes to accuse us and here's Jesus, our advocate. Paid for, paid for, paid for. He's the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation literally means the one that took the heat. He took the heat. He took the heat. He took the wrath of God for our sins. This is one of the most interesting scriptures in the Bible next. He himself, a propitiation of our sins, not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. The Bible says, many are called, few are chosen. Jesus said, narrow is the road that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. This doesn't mean everybody's getting saved. What this means is, is as Robert Jeffries says, and he says it very well, Jesus died sufficient for all, effective for those that get saved. Sufficient for all, effective for the elect. When Jesus died, he didn't leave anything out. He covered all of it. It's all covered. But not everybody's going to have the benefit. If you win a lottery ticket, remember that illustration? If you win a lottery ticket, what do you have to do? You're a winner! You don't get any benefit until you go turn it in. You got to sign the ticket. You got to turn it in. Turning it in doesn't mean you've earned the money. It's a gift, in a sense. I mean, okay, you may pay one dollar. It's not a perfect illustration, okay? But you didn't earn it, okay? You you need to go work a job to earn that million dollars or whatever it is that you're going to go down to Austin to pick up. All right. But you got to sign it. You have to own it. And we come to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I want to be clean. Jesus, I believe you're God. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord, the curiosity of my life. And the only way you can do that is you've got to get a God's eye view. You've got to get your eyes off yourself. You've got to get your eyes off your family. You've got to get your eyes off your friends, your eyes off your frenemies, your eyes off your whatever. You've got to turn your eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. When you do that, you're going to want to walk with the Lord. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what? The light of His Word. His Word, His Word. Stick with the Word. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't go into fantasy land. The Word. Just do the Word. What a glory He sheds on our way. Let us do His good will. He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Finally, I want to close with this. Petra, 1984, beat the system. I'm really thinking about singing this. You might see me stumble. You might see me fall. You may see me cornered with my back against the wall. Maybe incognito, maybe out to lunch, maybe caught red-handed, maybe just a hunch. But I'm clean, 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 clean before my Lord. Like a spotless lamb, I'm, I'm blameless in his sight. With no trace of wrong left to right, I'm clean, clean, clean. Kneeling in the closet, begging daily bread, there may be a skeleton hanging overhead. Where are my accusers? Nowhere to be found. They dropped their stones when the master came around. I miss the mark. I can't deny it. I don't condone or justify it. Don't condone. Don't explain. Don't justify. As a father, as a pastor, as a police supervisor, when I talk to people and they're like, well, here's why I did it. Don't tell me why you did it. Just don't do it. You tell me why, you're excusing it. Don't excuse it. I've missed the mark. I don't deny it. I can't condone or justify it. But I've done nothing that his blood can't wash away when I take it to the cross and start to pray. I'm clean. Clean. If you trust in Christ as your Savior, your account, your heavenly account, you're clean already in that sense. Nothing can separate you. Romans 8.1, for, no for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's covered. But 
James says, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So we can get dirty. And Jesus washed the feet, the feet of the disciples as an illustration of being in contact with that which has a tendency to soil us. You don't go to a friend's house for dinner in dirty clothes. You don't do that. You don't, you don't cut the grass and mow the lawn and do your yard work or go, go muck the barn and go, okay, it's time to go eat. Let's go to Billy's house. You don't do that. That would be terrible. God wants us to come to him, to bring to him the things that are holding us back, the things that are harming us. The fact that we have a sin that so easily besets us means that we all have a tendency toward certain things to repeat, repeat, repeat. And God says, break the cycle, I will help you. But it's got to be time for a change, which means we have to acknowledge it, we have to see it, we've got to hate it, and we have to let it go. We have to divorce ourselves from it. Exactly like the day that any of you that ever got married and you had the old school wedding vows. Obey your husband, just kidding. No, you had the old school wedding vow that says that leaving, you know, forsaking all others, you will cleave to him or her and him or her only, right? Forsaking, why? Because you've got to forsake them. Because every once in a while, somebody comes around that's not yours and you've got to forsake them and stick with what's yours. And if you're married any length of time, that happens. Stand with us. What that means is, beloved, that there are some things you need to forsake. There are some things that you need to put down. There's something for someone in this room today that you need to let go of and actively say, God, I'm giving this up. I surrender this. I reject this. I agree with you that this is harmful. And I am asking, first of all, I confess it. Second of all, I'm asking you to help me to make it right. In Jesus' name, Lord. Anybody that needs to do business with God, you're welcome to come down. We'll pray for you. We'll pray with you. If you're on Facebook, you can see me. You can find me. Let me know as we close down Facebook and have our in-house invitation. Someone said.